there, there was a real epic consolidation that had never happened before of moderates um, with Pete Buttigieg dropping out. And I think a lot of voters who did not want to see Bernie as the nominee, realizing that they had to coalesce behind Biden. Um, I think another critical factor, which I'm sure we'll talk more about, is the the massive loss, landslide loss in South Carolina. Um, and I think the campaign did not really uh, assume that there was going to be a loss and did not put enough resources into um, winning that state. And, and also, frankly, to grappling uh, with other lessons from 2016. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think we'll talk more about that. And, uh, and then I think the, the other piece was um, the way that the, uh, the media also covered the Biden win in South Carolina, which really gave him a huge boost going into, uh, into Super Tuesday. And, and the fact that we also didn't have the, the consolidation and um, the unity on the progressive side uh, left us in a position where we could never really recover after Super Tuesday, even though we just a few days earlier looked like we were on track to uh, win the nomination. Yeah, and, and could ask lots of follow-ups to that, but I, I do, and we'll kind of go back and forth, but I do want to bring in uh, Marcus, who was also involved, but in the 2016 campaign, and, and I'm not sure um, where you kind of positioned yourself this year or this past year, Marcus, but, you know, race in particular in the Bernie campaign was was a live wire, and, you know, uh, we've, I've heard a lot of critique about um, the campaign and Bernie himself not investing enough uh, in black outreach, um, in relationships with black leaders in the black community. Um, was there a way Sanders dealt with like policy positions that pushed uh, the black community away? Was it more about the structure of the campaign, the outreach? What, what was your assessment? as someone who thought deeply about this from 2016 and into this year? Oh, well, um, my position in 2020 was just an outside uh, endorser. I just endorsed the campaign and watched it from afar. I was too busy registering voters in Georgia mm -hmm. uh, to, to really kind of be in depth. Um, the campaign to me was, uh, the 2020 campaign to me was all, all but, at least with black voters, all but a loss by the time that 20, uh, 20 came around because of the lack of um, fundamental like outreach and relationship building that could have been done with one of the, you know, the largest email list and one of the largest like um, uh, money in the bank um, candidates uh, in, in, in the nation and in, in American history when it comes down to like having grassroots funding. And what I mean by that, and I try to say this not in a negative way, but um, there were just organic conversations, organic decisions that were made from 2016 that could have been addressed. Um, there was never a African-American outreach. My team never got a debrief whatsoever. We never got a chance to um, debrief from 2016. Therefore, we went into 2020 thinking that, you know, maybe they could do it bigger and better, but they didn't, didn't learn from the basic uh, problems that they had in 2020. 2016. And those problems that they had in 2016 were uh, definitely sy symptomatic of another major issue in politics and especially in progressive politics. And that is um, the, ad the adversity and the adverse reaction to black anything uh, and, and really trying to do dig deep and do deep work with doing things like listening to black staffers doing things like listening and hiring black consultants. And it's funny because, you know, my side of the progressive world, we always like to pick on the, like the centrist in the DNC for um, their treatment of African-Americans. But, you know, that campaign itself, uh, though well-meaning on its surface, has some very deep internal issues when it came down to dealing with internal politics of race. Um, African-American voices that were on the campaign that would say things uh, from, and this is from 2015 till this year, um, their, 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 their wants and their needs and uh, what they needed to win um, were, you know, ignored basically by powers that be. 
Uh, we have to be very realistic if we're going to have this conversation. We have to be very realistic that senior staff, I mean, and I'm talking about very senior staff, top level folks within the Bernie campaign prefer to do outreach to the Latino community over the African-American community. And whether that's systemic, whether that's a Bernie thing, whether that's a Jeff Weaver thing, whether that's a uh, whoever thing, uh, we have to be realistic about the effort that people actually put in to creating relationships and organic relationships. I, I will say another thing before I let it go. I think Bernie Sanders had a problem with believing that black voters weren't neoliberal. And I think the campaign had a problem with believing that there was such an entrenched dedication to neoliberal candidates that it's not worth our time to even go down there and create relationships. Uh, what I think the campaign forgot though is that all of our movements currently were basically based in the black power movements of the 60s. Uh, and a lot of what Bernie said derives directly from those power movements. The problem is he used our movements but he forgot about the black part. Uh, and this is not just to knock him. It is when you know that you have strategists from across the nation giving you some of the best advice possible on how you can move one or two points in South Carolina. And you decide that you don't want to do that because you don't want to take the chance. When you decide that you don't want to hire an African-American firm or do advertisements in you know, black paper and black media uh, when you should be, when your message would resonate. Uh, that's not a black voter fault, that's a campaigning fault. And I think that we refuse, I think that the higher ups refuse to even address that issue. This is the last thing I wanna say about it. Uh, in, early in 2019, the African-American outreach staff in 2016 damn near begged Jeff Weaver uh, to have a meeting with Senator Sanders before he goes and got deep into uh, the 2020 campaign, we begged him, listen, uh, we need to have a debrief about 2016. We, you know, we should have did this in, you know, in, uh, in 2016 itself, but that didn't happen. And we were, we were greeted with the response from Jeff Weaver, uh, which was absolutely not. Um, and, and that happened. So when things like that happen and you think you got it, then you just got it. And there's nothing, that's not much that you could do about it. Thanks, Marcus. That gives us a lot to discuss. Um, Bill, I, I wanna bring you in here. Um, you know, you and I have talked offline about this quite a bit, but you know, Marcus is giving us a pretty stark view of sort of the shortcomings. Um, you know, you've, you've often called in the experience of the Rainbow Coalition and the Jackson campaigns of 84 and 88 to make sense of present day electoral strategy can you can you help us take a step back and speak to the similarities and differences of the Sanders campaign in the moment that we're in with the Rainbow Coalition that formed around the Jackson campaigns and uh, help lift up some of the lessons from those earlier experiences to make sense of what happened with Bernie? Yeah, well, uh, first, thank you, Rishi, for inviting me. Um, just as a clarification, I'm, I'm the editor of the Global African Worker .com, but I'm not speaking on your behalf in this program. Um, these views are mine. You know, what was interesting, particularly in listening to what Marcus was just saying, is that when I think about the Jackson campaigns of 84 and 88, um, particularly in 88, <clears throat> there, was, there were multiple ways for people to get involved in a campaign at fairly high levels. One of the things that Jackson paid attention to uh, there, was a, there was a general theme that ran through the campaign, particularly in, in 1988. And he was very much emphasizing uh, justice and, and workers' rights uh, throughout the campaign. And, but there was a real attention to developing uh, legitimate constituency organizations that were very rooted, that um, had a great deal of influence on a campaign, and you truly felt like you were involved in a rainbow movement. Um, I, I think that uh, what I experienced in 2016 was very disappointing with the, uh, the Sanders campaign, uh, and, and again in 2020, where though in both campaigns I supported Sanders, um, it was hard as hell to get involved in a campaign. Um, 
in, in doing anything other than either being a surrogate or doing uh, uh, neighborhood work. But if you were trying to bring, and I'm not just speaking on, on, on my behalf, but a number of other folks that have had a fair amount of experience, there didn't seem to be a point of entry. This became a real problem. A second thing um, is that Sanders did not have a Southern strategy. Now, some people say he did. If he did, there, in, in my opinion, there's no evidence of it. Jackson had a Southern strategy, and uh, in, in, particularly in 88. And, and part of that was about building the right kind of ties. So in that case, between 84 and 88, in some cases before that, certainly, but certainly between 84 and 88, developing the right kind of ties with, uh, with the leaders, which is what I was hoping that Senator Sanders was going to do between 2016 and 2020, and spend a lot more time listening to and developing the right kind of ties in the South. Um, I, I know a little bit about South Carolina, and, I, and, and some of the key people that I know there, it, it's like they were never called. No one approached them. And I simply couldn't get it. I, I just didn't understand it. And I think what we have to be thinking down the road is that to the extent that we're carrying out a battle within the Democratic Party, um, and, and inside and outside of the Democratic Party, uh, we have to really be keenly aware of the key constituencies that are going to make it possible for some sort of progressive transformation. And this country's going nowhere without African Americans. And certainly the Democratic Party isn't. So it, it's, just, it's just something that should have, from the very beginning, what is our Southern strategy? Thank you. Um, and Alicia, uh, you know, j just kind of doing the rounds here and, and you were very much, uh, I remember um, Black Lives Matter was kind of on the debate stage uh, during the 2016 round. Um, and then obviously you and your organization um, were you know, weighing back and forth the candidates for this cycle. What have you heard that you kind of that you agree with or disagree with? And in particular, you know, wanted to ask a little bit about the kind of platform of the Sanders campaign. You know, I remember that the demands, uh, I think it's a movement for Black Lives kind of platform came out and there are some similarities between the Sanders platform and that one, but uh, there is also differences. And, you know, some people bring have this question, well, is, is it the universalist um, demands that are a problem because they don't speak specifically to race or was it really just more how him and his campaign talked about the issues um, but the platform was actually uh, correct so those are a few things I'd like you to reflect on. These are good questions and thank you and what an honor to be on this panel <laughs> at this time having this conversation so hi to everybody. Um, I'll just start off and say that I agree with Marcus, um, and I want to dive into a couple of things, uh, maybe like continue to elaborate on a couple of things that Marcus offered, because I think they're important for us to um, analyze. Um, I will also say that the position I'm speaking from right now is not BLM, it's not, for, it's not M for BL. Um, I am the principal at an organization that did a series of endorsements this year around uh, the primaries, and we based that endorsement on a Black agenda that we designed that um, came from a project that we did called the Black Census, which is the largest survey of Black people in America in 155 years. I'm saying that not to toot my own horn. I'm saying that to say that this agenda actually is important in this story because it does represent um, what Black folks care about across um, across a range of spectrums. You could say that this agenda is in, in, a, in a sense the consensus agenda. It is an agenda that folk agree with um, across income, across gender, um, and across a range of other demographics. Um, and I say that, and I posit that here because I think it's important to recognize that um, so often when it comes to black communities and particularly when black folks try to engage with campaigns, 
um, we run into a couple of challenges. I think one challenge is um, the notion that the things we're trying to move um, are not reasonable, right? That wasn't necessarily a Sanders campaign challenge, but it becomes a challenge when you're dealing with political campaigns overall. I think the other thing, though, that happens is that, um, you know, uh, folk want to figure out how to use rel uh, various communities um, for symbol and not substance. And I, I think as somebody who, you know, was, has, helped to create Black Lives Matter and tried to engage political campaigns in 2016, um, even though there's kind of this widespread narrative that we did not try to, um, we just chose to not endorse, but we certainly were in conversation with political campaigns for most of the electoral season. And what I can say is that in 2016, we had a really hard time even getting candidates to say Black Lives Matter. And that was progressive candidates, and it was also neoliberal candidates. And so the fact that in 2016 we were there after having had the first black president in the history of this country and um, at the kind of pinnacle and the height of um, the Black Lives Matter movement at that time, I think you could, alre you could already say that 2016 was gonna be a wash because the fight actually became around, um, uh, you know, us just trying to get to the basic steps and we hadn't even gotten into policy yet. <laughs> um, I will say that, you know, come 2020, I, I do, I agree with Marcus, we had four years. We had four years to build relationships. We had four years to invest in institutions. And um, we had four years to figure out how we were going to attach a um, voter registration and voter mobilization strategy as it related to black people. Um, and um, uh, to connect that to um, a campaign that I think um, in, in, you know, for all intents and purposes really did try and represent an agenda that would have moved black communities forward. Um, and with that being said, um, in four years, we were not able to actually close the gap between um, not only the relationships of uh, institutions rooted in communities to the campaign, but I also think a sense of um, a, a nuancing of, of what black communities needed to be won over in order to, um, in order to really win. And I, th I think um, one thing I would add here is that, you know, for me, I, what I experienced um, both in, you know, having gone through an endorsement process with the Sanders campaign, folk definitely did show up for it. Um, folk did reach out to us um, um, early. And I would say that um, when it came to substance around policy, uh, we, had, we had some difference. Um, I think one of the things that um, becomes really important in this moment is that we should be able to do a lot more at this stage than talk about Black communities as if the, the things that define us are incarceration, uh, uh, legalization, right? Um, and uh, frankly, sorry, what was the other thing? Mass incarceration, uh, marijuana legalization, and um, uh, police. I actually know that from our survey, you know, what Black communities said was our number one issue that keeps us up at night is low wages that are not enough to support a family. And so we really needed a campaign that wasn't just um, ideological, but we needed a campaign that was going to appeal to Black voters by being very specific about how you were going to improve material conditions for Black people. And that would have moved Black voters in a different direction. I don't buy the narrative that Black voters um, uh, are, by and are by and large in support of Joe Biden. I think what Black voters were in support of uh, was a candidate that they felt like could govern and could legislate. And, um, you know, the bar was not as high with Biden for sure, but I, I still feel deep sadness that um, at a time when we were able to um, move a candidate with an openly socialist agenda, I think we, we went back to particular patterns that we have, which was being much more concerned about um, cutting and narrowing as opposed to widening and broadening. And the fact of the matter is with, black, uh, with a lot of black voters, um, 
uh, what was going to appeal to them was not necessarily the socialist politic. I'm not saying that it was going to turn folks off, but I'm saying that that wasn't the thing that was going to bring black voters to the yard. Um, what was going to bring, bring black voters to the yard was a clear plan about how wages were going to be increased, how jobs were going to show up. Um, clear plans around housing, clear plans around um, uh, 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 health care. And frankly, if, if, if those bread and butter issues become ideological only, um, we always see problems in terms of moving black voters. And, and so I think that was difficult. Um, I also think you're right, Claire, that media, uh, mainstream media in particular, was brutal was absolutely brutal to Sanders. And uh, frankly, this, you know, there was a lot of tension, I think, and a, a narrative that the campaign could not shake um, around uh, supporters of the Sanders campaign. That is something that turns black voters off, frankly. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, we had four years to figure out how to counter disinformation. Um, and so that was certainly uh, happening. But I can also say that, uh, you know, when it came down to it from our perspective, from our organizational perspective, we actually ended up endorsing Warren. I can say that, you know, the bloodbath that I think happened towards the end um, with those two campaigns uh, certainly was not going to motivate black voters in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, finally, I'll just offer here that, you know, I think that campaigns in general, need to figure out how to work with movements, even if they don't do endorsements. Um, frankly, I don't think it's the job of movements to do endorsements. I think it's the job of movements to hold campaigns accountable and to support campaigns in talking to their base and to talking to the people that they're talking to. And I would hope that a lesson that we take from um, this last round is that uh, Perhaps endorsement isn't the goal here, perhaps engagement, right? And uh, a, not only a broadening of engagement, but an amplification of how campaigns can engage with movements um, is, is deeply necessary. Thanks, Alicia. And, and Claire, I want to bring you back, not to necessarily address everything that everyone said, um, but you know, you were in an you were specifically on the organizing team and leading the organizing team of the campaign. So uh, that's you know somewhat probably connected, but also different from many of the comments that folks are making. I was hoping you could, before we kind of move into the current moment, uh, talk a little bit more about the organizing department and what you feel were uh, some of the things that you all innovated on that should be brought forward into the next, you know, iterations of organization or campaigns? And to what extent any of your efforts brought, uh, you know, tried to bring in uh, black volunteers, volunteers of color organizers um, in, in that work? Because it feels and felt like there was lots of activity, uh, lots of donations and kind of more than in many presidential campaigns, any that I had experienced. Uh, but it wasn't clear kind of what the racial politics within or the racial representation within that were. Um, so yeah, any lessons from the organizing work? Uh, and of course you can respond to others, but um, you know, wanted you to speak on, on what you were involved in. Thanks. Um, well, first I just, I, I so wish that the 2020 campaign had one benefited from a debrief from everything that Marcus uh, learned and uh, observed in 2016 and in terms of what worked and what didn't work and what needed to be done differently. I think that as an organizer, whenever I do something, I, I am in the habit of the, the debrief of uh, start, stop, continue. And um, it's just so tragic and really outrageous that that didn't happen. So I, I just want to name that. And then also, I, I so wish that the campaign had benefited from um, from Bill's insights and Alicia's insights, and also that, um, yeah, that, that the people who you're saying did not feel like they could connect with the campaign or get through to the campaign or, or be fully understood by the campaign um, had really been, been heated. Um, I, I do want to say that I, I feel the need to bring up that um, I think we had some really great people who did 
some tremendous work, including like in South Carolina, where I, I think that we had more black state elected officials who endorsed our campaign than any others because the team there did a really good job. Um, but it sounds like obviously there were, I mean, look, we lost the state in the landslide. So obviously we did not do everything right, um, to say the least. Um, and I think part of that, that really goes to, um, you know, just a difference that Bernie has as a, as a politician, um, in the way that he does political outreach and, and the, the lack of interest in doing that, frankly, um, that is different from the way that other politicians engage where they're really good at building relationships and reaching out. Um, and that was, I think one of the pieces of advice that people gave him between, uh, between 2017 and, and 2019 to do to build those relationships. And it's, uh, it, it didn't happen. So I'm not going to make any excuses for that. Um, I, I do feel like we need to draw out the factors that led to the loss, um, in particular, and, and name one of them as being a, a, a lack of investment in paid media. And I think that that goes to, um, what Marcus said in terms of just who was in the room and who was making decisions. Um, and, uh, and it was not, it, it didn't include uh, enough black people, frankly, so um, or sometimes any. So I'm just I think that that was a, a major problem. Um, in terms of the organizing program, uh, I, I think that there there are so many things that I'm really proud of that we did. Um, we talked about Bill brought up constituency organizing. That was actually something that was really core to our organizing program that I think was different than a lot of political campaigns, which see constituency outreach as part of political, where we saw it as a kind of core pillar, um, along with relational or friend to friend organizing within our program. And it was something that we invested in, um, not as much as I, I wish we would have, but we invested in, in Iowa and Nevada. And it really was a key part of our victory in those states where, um, we were organizing workers, um, in immigrant communities, communities of color, um, and in, in particular in workplaces. And that was um, one of the, the innovations that I was really excited about, uh, where we, we had organizers who were doing kind of traditional union organizing techniques of canvassing workers at shift change and um, organizing people with Bernie's economic message um, in their place of work. And uh, yeah, I think another one was just building leadership at scale. Um, which was something that we we struggled with in 2016, where we got to a big scale, but we didn't really build deeper leadership. And it was something that we worked on through a number of programs um, this time. Uh, I think a, a, a challenge was transitioning some of those things to the later states because um, we had next to no staff uh, we were given for some of the later states because of the need to save every dollar for paid media. Um, and, you know, I'm glad that we didn't end up doing what Elizabeth Warren did, which was sort of break the bank on staff and to, um, to, to then like fall short in Iowa and New Hampshire because she couldn't spend enough money on TV. And so she kind of lost in the first round, but it was definitely a challenge from an organizing standpoint to, um, have to, to be told like, <laughs> go ahead and organize Texas with, uh, with one person, you know, you, you can't really do that. And then. Also, you, you definitely cannot build deeper political relationships and coalitions if you have one person for the entire state of, of Texas. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think in a lot of ways, the, you know, the Sanders campaign had sort of a unique relationship with labor that was different than how it chose, from, from my perception, how it chose to relate to other social forces where Bernie was willing at times to work with sort of labor leaders. And there was often, you know, this sort of really innovative uh, investment in actual organizing campaigns. And then it seemed in terms of other groups, in particular with, with Black folks across the South, there was a bit more of a reluctance to sort of work through established political leadership, which I, I think is an, uh, something we should we should keep talking about. But um, Alicia, I want to I want to bring you back in because we, you know, we really want to talk about how um, to, you know, how to pay attention to sort of the dynamics of the of the Black led uprisings and the sort of moment that we're in. And and the interaction, if there is any, between the sort of Bernie moment earlier in the year and sort of the moment that we're in now, um, you know, and you know, given the context of the pandemic, uh, how how have you observed uh, the people mobilized and politicized through the Bernie campaign engaging with the you know with the broader Black Lives Matter movement over the past month or two, if at all? Is you know, is there is there convergence or should there be? Um, you know, 
either either in general, like either in general or in specific instances, have you seen any kind of interaction? Um, I haven't personally, um, but again, I'm not speaking on behalf of m for bl or BLM. Um, I will say that, you know, the intersection here is uh, there are Black folks who were inside of the campaign who are part of these movements. And so, you know, our brother Phil certainly, you know, is helping to move a, a, another Black male uh, voter initiative um, forward. And so that's very exciting. I know Sister Nina Turner is out here um, doing incredible work, and I've had the pleasure and honor of working with her on a few projects um, but I, I, I think that, you know, that's most of what I've seen. Um, of course, uh, you know, Sister Ransby um, certainly is doing a lot of work inside of Movement for Black Lives, but these are not um, campaign people per se, right? This is uh, folks who stepped up to, to help amplify and, and give a, a different kind of platform to the campaign, but I think they are first and foremost kind of movement folk. Um, I haven't personally interacted with the campaign um, since, actually, um, <laughs> since the campaign um, called it. I think there are opportunities right now. And frankly, um, it would be good to hear the senator's voice on a lot of the issues that I think are front and center right now. Um, in particular, I think it would be important um, as we are moving into a deeply uninspiring election cycle, um, I think it would be important to um, see how, right, we can use the resources, uh, the infrastructure uh, of the campaign to be able to uplift the demands that are coming from this movement. I think it's a very inopportune time to, um, you know, do what I think I'm seeing, which is, uh, you know, a conversation uh, that is uh, an appropriate conversation that is about defunding police and policing, um, divesting from the carceral system and investing those resources into communities. You would think that there would be a natural alignment here, but I also am, a, am aware that there's a convention process happening and, and there's a lot of you know, uh, power dynamics at play. Unfortunately, I think what we are seeing from, um, you know, from some of our champions right now is a message that is deeply counter to the demands that this movement is putting forward and up to and including uh, you know, messages around you know, how police need a raise, uh, messages around how we need things like community policing. Again, I think we need to begin to, um, it's not too late is what I'm saying, to build the kinds of relationships that are beneficial, um, even if um, there's no longer a, 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 a race happening in terms of, of the Senator's campaign, um, there is still infrastructure there that can very much be leveraged to help amplify uh, the demands of this movement. So I would look forward to seeing uh, opportunities like that. And I'd be, I would look forward to being a part of, of being a part of opportunities like that. There are also clear opportunities right now to move forward demands um, that are coming around uh, how to improve the lives for, of black communities, especially in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, in the very beginning of an economic recession um, and in advance of a crisis in our democracy. Uh, I think it's important, right, that we use this kind of infrastructure um, to help amplify and elevate some of the challenges that Black communities are facing right now and some of the attacks that we're under. Uh, Marcus can tell you better than anybody. Um, we've got, you know, hundreds of voters, uh, Black voters in particular, uh, all through the state of Georgia who are waiting in lines for hours and hours just to be able to access their right to make decisions over the people who represent them. Um, in places like Kentucky, you know, voters turned up when they were locked out of polling places. It would be great to hear from campaigns who um, are, are really projecting a different um, vision for the future of this country to not have stopped at the primary when, when, the, um, when, the, when the race is over for that particular candidate. I think we have to draw a line of continuity here. And if the, the fight here was really about uh, amplifying and elevating uh, the possibility that democratic socialism could be the governing principles of this country, um, the fight for black communities should not have stopped. Um, and so I would just uh, say that those are key opportunities that are on the landscape right now. Yeah, 
those are really crucial interventions to make, Alicia. Thank you. Um, and we kind of want to build off of that and bring Marcus back in. But um, before I do that, I just want to tell the audience, we, we've heard that there was a couple tech glitchy problems in the beginning. I think they've all been resolved. So hopefully folks are okay. But if you want, uh, feel free to start a watch party on Facebook Live so we can build back some of the audience of the folks that made it drop off in that tech problem. But things look good on the front end now. But um, Marcus, I want to I want to bring you back in. Um, you know, one powerful aspect sort of of this moment is that, you know, it, it appears that Black leaders and Black organizations are, you know, truly genuinely in the lead and are, you know, for the most part, their leadership is being respected in the broader movement. Is this a sign of a potential watershed realignment of movement forces underway in this moment? Is is this, you know, is there um, the possibility of a front in sort of the way that, that Alicia just described for the 2020 election or for beyond that's led by black and brown forces and communities with with white people supporting alongside? Um, what what's sort of in development? What's what do you think is possible? Well, um, I hope so. I mean, white supremacy so far in America is undefeated uh, with a, with a couple of losses here and there. They're still kind of on top. And I don't want to say that in a negative way. I just want to say that in a realistic way. Uh, we cannot go back to the same policies, the same practices that we had uh, just earlier this year and expect any, anything different. Let me, let me bring something up. Uh, once progressives decide to center, uh, once white progressives decide to center black issues, you start handling the major issues of the country. So one thing that I used to say to Senator Sanders and the team all the time was, okay, Medicare for all. How does that affect black communities? And explain it to a black person. Okay, uh, you want college for all. Well, then first, let's talk about how we can get more African-Americans graduating from high school uh, and to, to get college for all, right? Um, have center these issues and think about them from a black perspective. Um, one of the most telling moments for me was in 2016 when um, the senator decided that he, he was going to go against reparations. Now, he has since that moment, he since kind of came back and said, listen, you know, I, I'm a supporter of reparations. But if Bernie had wholeheartedly supported reparations, then the conversation on the on the debate stage would have shifted. And there would be, you know, there'll be white kids and uh and gentrified neighborhoods wearing reparation now t-shirts, right? So I I, I want to say this right here because we talked about moving forward, and we and we talked about is there going to be a shift in the paradigm? The only way it can be a shift in the paradigm is if people who have been on campaigns for years, people who are in the streets and are part of the movement, are brought onto campaigns and are brought on to specifically the next big progressive campaign, and they're listened to, and they are appreciated. Uh, and, and they are respected as, as trusted voices, um, just like some of the white male consultants are. Uh, the last thing that I want to bring up, and this is very important, is, you know, I go protest. I, 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 I've been to the protests. I've been to the marches. And what I, what I noticed is that there's a very big difference between what we ask for in the streets and what candidates across the nation ask for uh, or talk about uh, when it comes down to uh, policy-wise, right? So the Sanders campaign and the Sanders kind of ideal is a problem. The streets don't center particular leaders. And I say this with a caveat because I don't want to disrespect anybody on this current, uh, on anybody, any of the surrogates for Bernie Sanders. But there is a problem, a fundamental problem with not centering the community over centering uh, surrogates and celebrity. And that was a very big Bernie problem. Uh, it's good to have surrogates, right? But don't roll out black people uh, expecting all the black people to just follow one person. You got to do organic dirt work. And until we get to that point where uh, we're not being used as faces, but we're, we're actually doing deep organizing in communities to, you know, to build relationships. Uh, like Sister Garza said, like, you know, uh, to build relationships you're going to have an easier time talking to dream defenders if you've had an office in Miami in the hood for uh, for two years or you have people down there talking about Senator Sanders for two years than just showing up during election day. So we have to start doing deep, deeper organizing and we have to hire folks and let them do their jobs and trust them. And also, the last thing, um, let's let black folks get their hands on the budget. 
Let's let African American campaigners and people who are working on campaigns have some version of a final say so when it comes down to how we're spending the money on the campaign and let them be in the room and let them do their jobs. Thanks, Marcus. Um, Bill, you know, I have a question for you about kind of labor and it's rolling on, but, you know, a lot's been said. I want you to be able to reflect if you've heard anything kind of this especially about the current moment and the kind of interaction between the streets, the campaign, some of the stuff that Marcus was bringing up, or just the realignment of people in general. What are you seeing uh, from your experience um, kind of coming out of the Bernie campaign into the pandemic and into this black uprising? How are things shifting and, and what, you know, what do you want to respond to from what you've heard? The, the, I want to say a few things. The, the Sanders campaign was clearly historic. It was uh, the most progressive campaign, in my opinion, at the presidential level since Jackson in 88. Um, and a lot of what I feel, I'm not going to speak for any of the other panelists, is a frustration built on knowing that things could have played out differently. And, and that, that is, that's what eats at me. Um, because this, this was a really unusual moment. Um, in terms of where we are now, um, I, I would just say this. One is, <clears throat> uh, November is not a contest between uh, Biden, assuming he's the nominee, and Trump. It's a, it's a real fight against a right-wing populist movement that Trump happens to uh, epitomize. And, and when people think about the election in terms of personalities, they're misreading the moment entirely. Uh, we're dealing with a, uh, a vicious, nefarious, uh, semi-armed right-wing movement that is interested in overthrowing the 20th century and everything that was accomplished. Um, right now, I think that the eruptions that have taken place since the murder of George Floyd have changed the political discussion in just some, such fundamental ways um, for the better. The problem is that in a spontaneous movement, there are going to be demands that come out that uh, precisely because it's a spontaneous movement, are going to be subject to myriad interpretations. Um, you know, whether one is talking about defunding the police, abolishing the police or whatever, there's going to be different interpretations. And that part of what's going to be critically important is the beginning of the consolidation of progressive forces that can take the energy out of the streets or from the streets, it's emerging from the streets, coalesce in very, very clear programmatic demands and push them. And I think that Alicia was onto something when she said it's not fundamentally up to the social movements to be backing uh, the candidates. Um, doesn't mean people should be sitting out the election, but I think that we need to be building organization desperately at this moment, because at some point with any kind of spontaneous movement, things are gonna crest and decline. And the forces of the right are waiting for that moment in order to seize their own opportunities. So um, I, that's what I think that we have to be focusing on. Yeah, and, and just to, you know, from your own you know, perspective uh, on labor's kind of involvement, um, either in the campaign or in this current moment, what are you seeing? Because you, we had a organize, organizing upgrade had a call last night. Sochi, who's with New York Working Families Party, said that there can be no successful movement for you know massive social change without organized labor, and obviously that party you know has labor as as part of it. Um, when you look at who's coming together to defeat the right to defeat Trump, it does seem maybe labor is being more bold or not. What are you seeing and kind of what do you propose? 
Um, real quick, uh, what I proposed was, uh, this is going to be very self-interested, was in an article that I wrote in The Nation uh, about five things that I think labor should be doing in The Nation magazine. But, um, I mean, real, Adam, I mean, the organized labor right now remains in a state of paralysis and crisis. Elements within organized labor um, became very active in the Sanders campaign, particularly. Uh, some in the Warren campaign, but much very active in, in the Sanders campaign. But in the face of the crisis that we've been seeing since um, COVID, uh, the economic collapse, and now these lynchings and the, uh, the uprisings that have taken place, organized labor is um, spinning. And, and while there are, in many cases, good positions that have been elaborated by certain leaders, and I don't want to take, anyone, take anything away from anyone, what we need is building a broad front. Uh, we really do need uh, labor and as many unions as possible, as well as non-union labor organizations, the domestic workers, others, um, to be spearheading a broad front against repression and in favor of democracy. We need that now. And that's what exactly needs to be tied into the motion on the streets. Uh, that's what I think that labor needs to be doing. That's what I think it needs to be concentrating on and not hoping that a Biden victory will result in the pendulum swinging the other way. Uh, I don't trust pendulums and politics is not about them. And so what we need is, is real organization. That's what I'm really advocating. And, and frankly, part of what's going to be necessary is that we're going to have to encourage several union leaders to go into retirement. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, the question of building new organization, you know, listeners of our show will know that that's a repeated theme and one we're going to keep coming back to. So thanks for making that agitation. Um, Alicia, we're going to give the final word to you in a second. But before we do that, uh, Claire, I want to bring you back in. You know, a lot of our questions have sort of asked you to look backwards on sort of what worked, what didn't inside the campaign. But I want to give you a chance to say, you know, between now and November, there's a lot at stake. I think everybody on the panel sort of made clear sort of what, how to view, the, you know, the next several months. Um, what do you think is sort of most important for left organizers in the electoral space to be doing between now and November? Um, I think that everyone needs to, uh, be supporting the movement for basic democratic rights and black liberation and for defunding the police and uh, uh, dismantling our um, dismantling our, our mass incarceration system and uh, attacking systemic racism. I think one that is really important to lift up. Um, I think it's it notable that um, you know Bill was talking about the Rainbow Coalition that. Um, the, the socialist left has at times um, failed to get behind movement for black liberation, such as uh, Jesse Jackson's campaign. Um, I, I think that we're, we're broadly seeing uh, a lot of people in society get behind these protests to a degree that is even shocking to me. Um, so, so I think that's number one. The second is we need to be organizing around this um, pandemic. We are approaching a cliff where millions of people are going to lose their homes um, and uh, be foreclosed upon, be evicted, um, are, are going to be in breadlines. And the Democratic leadership is uh, completely inept. Um, they just massively transferred wealth upward to uh, corporations with the initial bailout. Um, and we, we really have to be applying a lot of pressure to them. And then I think we have to be setting the stage for fighting for what, if a, if a Joe Biden presidency um, becomes a reality, and if we take back the Senate, I think there's going to be a major fight over the mandate that he has, because he's probably going to win if he wins with a lot of um, former Trump supporters coming back in, and they're going to try to um, claim the mandate and say that, that we just need a return to normalcy. And we have to say, no, uh, the status quo is not working for too many people. Thanks, Claire. Alicia, final words. You know, a lot of people are, are, are smelling blood in the water with Trump. You know, people think that he's sort of on the ropes, maybe at his, at his weakest point. What's your agitation? What's between now and, and November? What's the most important thing for people to do?
Hey, muted, but now back. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I mean, I think the most important thing for people to do, honestly, is turn out and to get all their people to turn out too. But I want to say that in context. You know, today, Donald Trump tweeted that he uh, believes that Black Lives Matter is a symbol of hate. Uh, you know, last week, uh, Bill Barr, who heads the Department of Justice, announced that they are convening a task force uh, to look at uh, organizations uh, like ours uh, and like this one here, right, that um, he deems to be uh, uh, related to Antifa. Um, we are as co-founders, Patrice and Opal and myself, um, certainly being attacked every single day um, on right-wing channels and by right-wing pundits, uh, not only about our politics and our ideology, but literally being attacked on the basis of um, these uprisings. And so I want to be very clear that the most immediate task um, is not to um, just love what's happening in terms of the rebellions that are, are, are sweeping the country, it's to actually now stand in defense and support of this movement. And we've seen this playbook, we saw it in 2016. Uh, in 2016, you know, uh, Donald Trump floated the idea of BLM being labeled a terrorist organization. Uh, they started to uh, craft new designations inside of the FBI, including one that they called a black identity extremist. Um, and I think we need to take these types of threats seriously, not just because it's me, but because activists and organizers and community members across the country who participated in protests, who have been helping to take down Confederate statues, um, this president is actually putting up wanted posters with people's faces on them. Um, what mm -hmm. Bill said is right. Uh, the time right now is not about kind of the uh, clash of personalities. Um, and it's not even about parties at this point. Um, there is a growing right-wing populist movement that um, has taken power in this country and plans to, frankly, hold on to it. Um, and so I believe that what we've got to do as a movement um, is absolutely get it together and absolutely broaden. Um, and one of the ways that we can broaden is in defense of this movement right now. Um, and, you know, as, as we're seeing, you know, folks across the country of all races, backgrounds, ethnicities, and creeds stand up to say Black Lives Matter, we have to also make sure that people understand the backlash and that they can interpret the backlash in such a way that they don't just see it as a shame or a shameful thing that's happening to somebody else, uh, but that they see it as a personal attack on them and their futures. So that's what I would say the most immediate task is for us to do right now so that we can even get to November. Amazing. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, all of you. Um, what an amazing note to end on. Um, so that's a wrap for tonight. Uh, thank you so much to all the guests. Really rich discussion. Our next show is on July 22nd, same time, same channel. Uh, 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. We already know on that show that M. Adams from Freedom Inc. and Judith LeBlanc from Native Organizers Alliance will be on, and they'll be joined by a couple other excellent guests to be announced soon. Please join us. Adam, why don't you take us home? Thanks so much uh, to Organizing Upgrade, Real News Network, for making this show possible. Thanks to all the guests. Um, you know, really want to lift up what Marcus said, white supremacy has been winning the rounds in this country. Um, hopefully we're seeing a good body blow and a, a knockout punch happening soon. Um, really appreciate people bringing their full selves and not pulling any punches on this show. So until next time, keep fighting, keep organizing.